I will go live to Facebook. And I always used to laugh at Jonathan when he did this bit because he always looked like he was concentrating and and now I realize you have to concentrate or you write something stupid in the description. Uh, here we go. Over to you, birthday boy. I think you can start at 5.05. Well, muchas gracias, as they say. Well, <clears throat> today is my 57th birthday, and, and uh, I'm grateful to all of you for coming and reading and sharing in this day of glory. As some of you know, I've been through lots of, lots of illness and nightmares in the last four or five years, but I have emerged again. And uh, yeah, it's touch and go sometimes, but uh, I feel strong at the moment and I'm writing away and publishing in a way. And I'm so delighted to have so many um, poet friends and um, writers, um, artists, colleagues, musicians, um, fantastic people in my life. So let us, now start our show with a um, something from my co-host Cassandra Atherton, based in Melbourne, Australia, who is an award-winning prose poet and international expert on prose poetry. Uh, Cassandra's prose poetry is widely anthologized and has been translated into Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. Cassandra has published more than 30 books and is currently writing an illustrated book of prose poetry on the Hiroshima Maidens with funding from the Australia Council and the Victorian government. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry, an introduction, and co-edited the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She's commissioning editor of Westerly Magazine and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. Happy birthday. It's a bit early for a champagne, but if the show goes well, you never know, I might crack one uh, later in your honour. Uh, I am going to... Time, a baby champagne, yeah, a little one, a piccolo, I think they're called. <laughs> I'm going to read one of Mark's poems this week, I think, uh, to honour him on his birthday. Uh, I've chosen one from a manuscript I'm writing the introduction to. It's a pretty phenomenal book, and uh, it deals with all kinds of issues about extinction, and, about, and it's kind of eco-poetry and futuristic at the same time. So this one's called Lesser Known Creatures of the Deep. A globster appeared on the shore on New Year's Day. Children and wild dogs could be seen walking back to town with a giant tentacle, a barb, part of a fin, a shiny scale, or in Eamon's case, an eye, one of four around the size and colour of his sister's newborn head. He weighed it in his hands and decided it was a little heavier than a cantaloupe. With a bundle of string, Eamon fashioned a halter for the eye and took to wearing it on his back like an eyeball knapsack. That evening, as he and his friends were futzing around near the disused plutonium plant, tossing empty bottles into broken windows, the eye started to weep salty tears. Why do you think she's crying, Momo asked. He had a great smear of dirt across his forehead. His mutt, Machiavelli, had a piece of something in his mouth that looked like mint jelly, but smelled like rotting fish. Meanwhile, a great dollop of sticky liquid ran down Eamon's legs. Eventually, they all surrounded the eye perched on top of a drum marked toxic waste. Eamon, Momo, Musty and Machiavelli stared in disbelief. The eye appeared to be blinking. Could it be a crydibus? Momo said. A froken, said Musty. Only Eamon knew the Muscamo had those fine eyelashes. I would like to introduce the birthday boy himself, Mark Vincennes. Join in with this famous bio that's known all around the world now. Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist and musician. 
He has published over 30 books of poetry, translations, and fiction, including more recently, 39 Wonders and Other Management Issues, The Pearl Diver of Irun Mani with White Pine Press, A Splash of Cave Paint with Spite and Dival, and a chapbook, An Alphabet of Last Rites with Chavana Barber. The King of Prussia is Drunk on Stars is forthcoming in April 2024 from Lavender Inc. Mark is also a prolific translator and has translated from German, Romanian, and you know it, French. And he has a little award that we're not allowed to announce yet, but it's exciting anyway. He's published 11 books of translations, most recently, <clears throat> the important one, and Audible Blue, Selected Poems, 1963 to 2016, by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Matz. His own, his own work has been translated into many languages, including Japanese, Chinese, Russian, French, Italian, Romanian, Greek, German, Icelandic, and I always add pig Latin in. He is currently working on a novel entitled The Age of Occasions. Vincenzi is editor and publisher of Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. Here we go, people. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China, to Iceland, to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the Peak in Hong Kong, but now lives on a farm in rural western Massachusetts overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain, Melville's inspiration for Moby Dick, where there are more. All right, here we go. He's given me a mouthful this time. <laughs> Abbreviated button slug moths, catalpa sphinxes, and giant long-tailed ichneumon wasps than people. <laughs> there are some great birthday insects in there, Mark. Happy birthday. Will you read for us, please? I will. I will. My God, you managed that really well. You must have practiced a little bit, no? I, I did have a look when I was still in bed this morning, and <laughs> I thought I better prepare this one a little bit. <laughs> I was hoping to give you a bit of more, more of a tongue twister. That was bad enough. This, this poem is called uh, A Bestiary, uh, and it's from a collection I'm working on at the moment, Spells for the Wicked. All the lions have gathered, claiming their space as kings and queens of beasts. The others hold their own, stand firm in their respective fields of expertise those who congregate, those who scry, those who hold back in waiting, and those who fly above this pasture of incidental pleasures where across the valleys and the forested inclines, all manner of life may be pounced upon. Up high, the eagle stakes her claim. That one is mine, she cries. The other birds hold back, allowing themselves to be carried aloft by thermals until the majestic birds of prey have had their fill. On telephone poles, ravens and sparrows eye the scene from all angles, working the currents and the updrafts of pollen and bees. They know the best meat is near the heart, firm yet flexible. The battle for the last scraps of flesh continues. Whoa. Oh. So here are two. Oh, here's one poem from um, the next collection of mine that's coming out, uh, full, full length collection from Lavender Inc. next year um, in April. The King of Prussia is Drunk on Stars is the book, and this poem's called Unhand Me, You Cad. That secret life passed by, lit by clouds. You woke up again, stirred in your fiery pillars, crossed land to edge land with those innocent eyes, somewhere in the knees. I felt it when you saw the city lights from the hills. As you descended into the dark, your cool hands pressed together. That is my tree, you said, purring. I want to be a tree like that, I said, whirling in my dizzy head. That night, the great snows descended. Here, where the crossroads meet, the clouds became one and a white light burst across the sky. I was like a lump of clay in the road, you were like a peacock, preening, but half petrified in fear. Hold me fast, you said. The great telescope 
on the other side of the earth runs through all waveforms of light, only to come out this side. In a fit of fury, we left the city on the first bus out of town. We hit a neon sign on the outskirts, which read, get your mixed metaphors here. And well, considering it's my birthday, I'm gonna read it a little longer than I normally do. Um, and this is um, a kind of unusual prose poem. Um, well, see what you make of it. Um, it's called Fairy Ecology. A silent movie set on the planet Urethra. In the manner of Jean Cocteau et al, part one, in which our protagonist is thrust into a maelstrom of possible outcomes. During the dust brawl, as Madeline and Gerald made their way across the Umerian continent in an early Zapoon Model P, Gerald decided it would be best if they both learned a version of Elephantino. What better to do when the world is ending, he had said, in an outdoor cafe picking particles of nitrogen from the surface of his alphabet soup. Madeline, who had just lathered herself head to toe in an anti-dust cream she had purchased at Waldrons for 99 cents in the public baths in Luckless City, lit up for the first time since Brigwell. I could think of a few things, she said, breaking out her last bottle of old man Junson's cure-all 99 proof snake bite. This'll soothe the soul, she said. Aside from the soothing of the soul, the cure-all was good for hepatitis, encephalitis, early pregnancy, hemorrhoids, and various ailments of the roof of the mouth. Gerald took a nip then turned to the golden horizon, which appeared to be filled with a billion glimmering fairies headed their way south for the winter. Apparently, or so it had been said, the wide-toothed pipe-smoking fairy, Ansibiliticus coagulantis, would return at a 25-degree curve each spring to the forests of their birth. Learning Elephantino? One fairy blurted out while zipping by at a 25, 27 degree curve in a southerly direction. Pa, you might as well pull my wide toothed teeth. Another, clearly not on a diet, hovered over Gerald's soup for a second before flashing off. Gerald had not paid attention, however, he'd been staring at the growing puddle of liva soul beneath the picnic bench. Part two, two weeks earlier. Clash of the Titans. The union leader in his favorite striped tie and the crocodile leather belt left to him by his mother's deceased lover strides across the wooden stage at the county fair. He wears a checkered shirt, dark blue bespoke birangs and smokes a twisted cilian cigar. His silver automatron is being buffed by a former high lie eye player named Cleo out in the VIP parking lot where even the chauffeurs are served frosted fizzle pop wine and wafer thin treats with creamy, spicy and salty toppings. Cleo adores the delicately sliced idumano fish soaked in nosh and oaked fairy brine, but now Cleo lies reclined in the shammy upholstered autotron smoking on their own cheroot, when at the same time, the union leader creeps up to the mic. 15,000 good folk have gathered here today in the name of Libersol. Cleo turns up the radio. Yes, we are all country people, the union, union leader says. We all yearn for the most unique of pleasures, and in harvesting our bounty together, we shall share in the glory of a satisfied nation. A woman with big hair by the name of Tusalat 
furnishes the grand introductions, Eden this and heaven that, the creator blesses you all and so on. The crowd roars, Livasol flags flutter wall to wall, little boys and girls in garlands of wildflowers tossed white petals and flyers from every rooftop and every spare balcony. As you know, good people, the union leader says, Livasol is the emblem of the monarchy and the constitution, the ratification of justice and order. Livasol is every living thing that ever was and ever existed. Once again, the crowd roars and more petals fall. From the assembled, a man in the crowd sporting an anti-immortal t-shirt raises his fist and roars, you think you discovered immortality? A group behind him in masks and black vests chant, death to immortality. How could extending your life be a wrong thing? A woman standing next to Gerald says. She wears her rouge high on the cheek and her name is Madeline. Once upon a star, says Gerald. Part three, in which our protagonist deciphers the finer principles of fate. One here, one there, says Madeline, also now staring down at the puddle of Livasol, and then again here, here. Thankfully, she wore her anticoagulators. Madeline pointed across the yard beyond the tiny metahomes and the unkempt weeds and the little shreddings of pink epholiac caught on the bush thorns. And as she and Gerald strolled along the embankment down to the source of the effluent, he came to notice there were tiny telltale bone fragments all along the fence. Above, a musquak soared, its fine wings honed to a leathery sheen it slipped through the atmosphere and into another and cawed above the wind. Gerald could just make it out, and of course, it was an evil omen. Ahead, the factory spewed and roared. A fellow in a striped face mask with a yellow hat raised his hand as they neared. Halt right there, he shouted, then raised his smudge stick as a show of intentions. This area is cordoned. Technology is currently being appropriated by His Majesty the Emperor. We expected a leak or two, Madeline said, but this is outrageous. Just think of all the life you've just thrown away. Nothing's thrown away, I said. You know that. Yes, yes. It all enters the great recycling, she said, sneering at the guard. Live a soul is in every living thing, said the guard, barely moving his lips. In the bulrushes, beneath those tiny little fragments of bone, a bottom feeder listened in. Part four, malfeasance. The union leader makes quick strides to exit the arena, but by this time, the anti-immortals have descended upon the VIP section. Gas canisters are tossed, gunfire is heard, but in the manner of a pro high ally player, Cleo snatches up their boss and rushes him to the city, cordons to write out the storm. He and Cleo, gulping deep breaths, stare down toward the darkening blur on the horizon. Then he notices the fairies. Migration time, says Cleo. And there were millions, perhaps billions of them, rolling in ahead of the dust brawl intermission with dramatic music, which we don't have today. Part five, six months later, in which our protagonist discovers what is behind those bone fragments. In between the cracks on the concrete that support the solar pylons, a purple flowered weed grows, Mysticulus armagentus. It grows and recedes in quick time as the reel speeds through all five seasons, though the fifth 
seems longer than before, and the scrub trees have not come into bloom as expected. What lies behind the pylons comes into focus, a bright blue billboard with the word libasol, and beneath it, immortality, man's ultimate recycling project. The sky is clear tonight. Not a speck of dust grazes the stillness in the atmosphere. The air tastes fresh, as if it has just flown across the glacier. There is not a bone fragment to be seen. Part six, in which our protagonist is now extinct. The last wide-toothed, pipe-smoking, weary fairy arrives back at her place of birth, her wings crushed, her pelvis bruised, her eyes a continual stream of tears for all the dust which has now subsided and the hundreds of loved ones lost in the storm. She lays a single egg in the dirt. She places it under the Libasol sign, twitches twice, then promptly dies fade out to immortality, man's ultimate recycling project. Amazing. Thank you so much for your early reading. I know that Mark's got something special coming up for us a bit later in the show, but I'm going to jump in here because I invited a special guest today. I invited Dominique Vincennes, Mark's amazing sister who has so many uh, incredible things to her name. It's impossible to list them all, but she does work as a mindful recovery coach and uh, a yoga coach. And she's also a poet, on, I think, uh, or she is these days. And I've asked her to come along and read for us this, this morning, I was going to say, this evening for you. It's so great to see you, Dominique. Can we get you to say a few words to your amazing brother? Thanks, Cassandra. Happy birthday, Mark. And hello to everyone that is definitely a much better poet than I, but I shall give it a go uh, in a minute. But um, just wanted to say I don't get to see my brother very much. The last time I saw my brother was before COVID began. And um, he is the best brother in the world. I'm sure he's a great friend to you and a great colleague, but I have the pleasure of having known him for almost 55 years. So um, I, I'm pretty lucky. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to read two of Mark's poems that I understand. Uh, and uh, some of you are going to chuckle at that, I'm sure. And um, then I might read you a poem that I wrote for Mark. That would be so amazing. First poem that I would like to read that Mark wrote is from here Comes the Night Dust, it's the one book that I think I understand every poem in. And it's a meditation on Kabir. So inside the body is a seed. And inside that seed is a body. And as the river gives herself to the ocean, so the ocean moves within you to awaken beauty. You too must have slept a million years. Why not awaken this very dawn and bring your mind down to silence? Then open your eyes. The musk is in the deer, but the deer does not seek it. She wanders eagerly sniffing for fresh grass. Where else might you hear such a stirring? From the breathing inside the breath? Now, open the window toward the east and vanish deep into the air. Meet her with the whole length of your body and reach for that place right there. The last of the Zen poets. 
Last night, I was blinded by a sharp ray of light. Strange. In my dream, I was trying to catch a squall. And when I awoke, feeling this urge to dance, I, I followed the leaves shaken loose along the riverbank. As the river pierced the valley with a booming rush, I found the moon in a fast, contented sleep. It was a perfect moment to let my mind become still. For when I reached the coast, I wrapped myself in oyster tight, in the ocean calm, and opened. So I'll give you a little bit of a heads up as to what this poem is about. When Mark and I were very little, we lived in the English countryside. Um, I lived there from the age of three to seven. So Mark was five until nine. And we lived in a very old house. Depending on who you ask, people will tell you uh, it was 100 years old, 200, 300. We're not really sure. It always got 100 years more every now and then. But it was noisy, as you could imagine, and I was a little girl, and this happened very often. And it's called Midnight Hero. Just alone, sorry, just a child alone, swaddled in the silence, where darkness coaxes dragons to tiptoe around your room, weaving themselves amongst the daisy chains painted on your walls. Your heart beats as your knocked knees slide up against soft sheets, kissing your chin. Where bunched up blankets of bravery promise to protect you. 21 steps away, the hum of television voices, the ones you're too young to listen to. A faint smell of cigarettes nestles itself inside the back of your throat, touching the tops of your lungs. No one has yet deciphered the root of your asthma. Perhaps it's the cat. Predictably, the ghosts between thick plaster walls in the corridor just behind the daisy chains rally for your attention as they waltz to the tap, tap, tapping of the radiator. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You slide beneath the armor of your sheets under the eider down, breathing the smell of sweaty stuffed animals, hoping they'll coax you to sleep. The tabby cat, the one you're allergic to, curls himself around your feet, purling, purring a lullaby. And then a sudden surge of courage where thick layers of threaded armor are thrown right and left, tumbling to the ground. You sit bolt upright, risking it all to escape, catapulting yourself away from the clutches of Panda and Bobo the bear as they beg to come with you. No time for that. Abandon ship. The cat jumps off the bed. A thin tube of light under the door, followed by darkness. Hurried, your naked feet trip over the nubbly woolen pathway, your left hand now dragging the sweaty corner of the comforter, the other like a sword pointed in front of you. Courage! Rounding the corner, the wall catches your baby toe just before you reach safety. You snatch it back, now running. It's all worth it. You've made this trek before arrived. No dragons here, just your brave brother. Can I sleep here? Of course. I'll protect you. Now go to sleep. Amazing. There's another poet in the family, Mark. <laughs> I wanted to say before I mute myself, that absolutely happened for many years um, as we lived in that old English country home, but it has happened for 54 years of my life. And I, it is a metaphor for the kindness and support of my big brother always. So happy birthday. Thank you, my love. 
We shall talk about it later. <laughs> um, I'm now delighted to introduce the first of our features today. Um, the first of whom is Eva Saltzman, uh, whose books include Double Crossing, New and Selected Poems from Blood Axe, Bargain with a Watchman from Oxford, and Women's Work, Modern Ri uh, Women Poets Writing in English from Seren, co-edited with Amy Wack. Uh, Eva's writing has been broadcast on BBC Radio, published in the New Yorker, New York Literary Supplement, Plowshares, Kenyan Review, and many UK papers. Among her libretti is, by the way, Cassandra, written for her composer, Father Eric Saltzman, uh, and one, two, uh, composer Gary Carpenter for the English National Opera Studio. Uh, Eva um, is also a member of the Society of Authors in Chol Mondley, and uh, the UK Art, she is a member of the Art, UK Arts Council, uh, UK Arts Council Awards, excuse me, um, as well as fellowships at Villa Mont Noir in France and Royal Literary Fund fellowships at War Warwick University and Ruskin College, Oxford. Uh, Eva's most recent work includes poems in Granta online, a memoir contribution to the book Between Fury and Peace, The Many Arts of Derek Walcott from Arrowsmith, an essay on Sylvia Plath for the Scottish journal Dark Horse, uh, a review in Bir Poetry Birmingham, and a project on the late poet Sarah Hanna. Uh, Eva is a dual citizen of the US and the UK. Welcome, Eva. Eva, how's your sound working? You're not in love with lists. <laughs> the kind dead organized with a running jump on time. No, that's not you. Your 11th hour right down to your toes. The clock says eight on time. So wait, cause you'll be miserable until it's half past eight and your 11th hour dear, still tracking down your clothes. You're feeling pretty great. Somewhere in the musty recess of your mind, there lurks a date, but that's weeks old. Oh, baby, that's how the 11th hour goes. A guy hangs loose, relaxed, while empires burn. You know that if we had a tardy tax, you'd be for sure 11th hour, paying big time through the nose. Don't you just hate when pals don't show? Leave you standing at the gate, 11th hour style. How dare they change the way the river flows. Ah, hell. Better lay some bait to get them out the door so they're the ones who'll have to wait. Because don't you know, nothing happens till the 11th hour shows. In case the clock is fast and you surprise yourself, on time, well, just keep walking past. Cross the street and walk 11th Hour Avenue where no one knows. Hey, there's cargo and there's freight. And which is which, you'll never know. The hour's never late until 11th Hour's gates swing open, then swing back and start to close. Ain't it a crime to be the last behind, the last in line, 11th hour, not a soul behind. You can't deny the choice you chose. Go on, backpedal at a frenzied rate, but you'll still face an undone masterpiece. Consider fate, finally, now that it's the 11th hour and a chill wind blows. Has the birthday boy gone? He's uh, there somewhere I would... in the background. He's what? He's usually loitering in the background. Oh, oh he's probably in his easy he's chair. Here. That's he's exactly what I'd do after I was through. Anyway, just, just to say, thank you very much for asking me here, Mark. I'm pleased to be here and happy birthday. I don't really have a birthday present. It just feels really ridiculous to have champagne you can't share with anybody. Um, um, I guess the only surprise that I, I, the 11th hour beware, somebody said, yeah, you said it. Um, the only surprise, I do have a surprise though, which is that I'm gonna read one really short poem that's life affirming and positive. <laughs> that's about as surprising as it gets um, as a kind of birthday present. 
Um, and uh, again, I think there are a lot, a lot of writers are, are teachers in one fashion or another. And um, I always remembered this story, particularly when I was like starting off teaching and trying to figure out how to get and keep uh, students' attention. And this story of this professor walked in the first day of term, this big lecture hall, and then goes up to the blackboard and writes in huge letters, S, E, X. And then all the students file in and it's a big lecture hall. And so there's quite a lot of them and they see what's on the board, S, E, X. And they're all really quite quiet. Um, and anticipating this, this two hour lecture. And he begins the lecture and he lectures for a couple of hours and they're all hanging on every word, waiting for the SEX, uh, which never comes. And I thought, well, that's, that's a really good tactic. And it also has absolutely nothing to do with the poem I'm about to read. And in fact, it's an introduction that's infinitely longer than, than the poem I'm about to read, which is called Sexual Love and um, might appear to be not about that at all, but about clamming in the Shinnecock Bay out in Long Island. The motorboat's charge trickles to shore, diminishing. The bay tends back towards peace. And that's why I like it. Though clamming by foot takes time, a certain readjustment of the will. At first, the mud's unwearable for its soft give, the deepening silent rip of ancient silk. The way it clings around the ankles will never tear or tears repeatedly the old healing. I'm only gonna read two more poems. Um, I always think that it's great when, when, when the poet gives you a heads up about about that. Um, it kind of concentrates the, the mind. Well, I, I hope it does anyway. Um, and um, the next one I'm gonna read, and I did actually um, plan to put the link to Grant Online where this poem was recently uh, 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 published and, and being as usual, totally um, disorganized. Uh, I haven't got it with me, but you can, um, uh, you can Google it online and um, it's there. <laughs> really, it is. Um, two poems, and this is the first one. It's kind of part of a new series. The, the, one, the two I just read you are from uh, already published books from a new selected uh, uh, called Double Crossing, which is published by Blood X. And um, the other one also in that, in that collection, although it was originally in the Oxford book. And this is a new poem. Um, and um, uh, it's kind of part of a series that I've been doing that's kind of been playing with a lot of repetition, but not rhyming, um, but repetition in another sort of way. Um, and I actually have been, I performed it with a Dublin jazz singer um, uh, friend who I've also collaborated with, and she set some of my work. And it was kind of interesting because we did it in a kind of improvisatory way on, on a stage as part of her British Council tour. And, and, and there, the musicians sort of improv with it. And I thought, oh no, it's Allen Ginsberg. I'm not Allen Ginsberg, but it kind of worked out really interestingly because I ended up kind of mo modulating my tempo and the way I read it with the musicians. So I ended up kind of playing, being a kind of instrument with the, the, the rhythm. But the poem um, uh, has started off with me thinking about like people not believing what you say and it ended up taking on a much greater context in this day of age of fake news and you know truth and fact and fiction and all that and I hate it when people explain what their poems about and that's about all I'm going to say <laughs> whatever it is I say I said or did because they said I didn't say or do it by virtue of my belief becomes what they said I said or did the more often I say I hadn't said what said I meant to have said, the more compelling becomes the evidence I did. That belief of theirs more virtuous too. Saying I didn't say or do it defies believability. Believing in my own belief in my own fact belies true fact, demonstrates the one unalterable fact, there's no fact, they say. Their statement, 
of the fact of this fact, of course, being fact. There never is or was a, a single fact among facts I deem fact. It's funny that, and that's the only fact. It's impossible that anything to which I attest as fact is fact, having been delayed by a purveyor, me, whose grasp of fact can't be trusted and who holds mere point of view. I don't know if you've met these people testing your attachment to facts themselves, attached to the fact there's no fact, which belief of theirs can constitutes fact, but they see no problem there. Hopefully you never do. That is, meet these people, marry them or love them much. I might as well have not said or done what I said I said or did. I might as well have said or done instead what they said, even if I hadn't. Gratitude is due these people to, gifting me purpose, enabling me to embody the fact that their point of view is in point of fact, fact. I'm going to read one more poem, a sonnet. So, you know, it's 14 lines long, a little bit of an intro. It's called Trepand. And this is also brings in a teaching experience because I was teaching at the Arvon Foundation, which may or may not be familiar to other writers or to people in England, but it's they hold writing uh, residency, writing courses over five days. And um, as usual, as teachers, we all have this reservoir we um, to draw from for exercises. And then sometimes we run out of stuff particularly if we've been drinking too much wine the night before. I don't know if that's what happened this time, but whatever it was, I picked, a, I plucked a book off the shelf. Um, it was in the middle of the countryside and they have a library there. And I found this book of kind of eccentrics, British eccentrics. And there was this chapter about this guy who had done a sort of self, do it yourself trepanning thing. Um, and um, I don't know if any of you know or remember what trepanning is, but basically you drill a hole in your head, which so you're nodding. Yeah, I know all about it. I'm thinking, oh my God, we've all been trepanned here except me. It says, uh, with the, the idea being that you reach a higher plane of enlightenment. And I think it's quite ancient. It might even be originally go back to the Egyptians, but it's a very ancient. And you, you drill the hole in the soft bit. Is it the patella? I've forgotten the, the name now. And, and then hopefully you reach higher plane. And when you're born, the, the skull isn't quite fused yet. So supposedly at that point, you're still kind of closer to that higher plane before the, the skull is fused. And anyway, in this, this chapter I'm reading, he's describing that he's doing this. And it's a bit of a kind of hippie guy and his, his wife, I think, or his partner. And they have to take drugs in service of science, of course. Uh, to prepare themselves for this this very difficult you know procedure, and then he describes it as if it's a kind of scientific uh, experiment, you know, and what he needs to to, to collect all all of the items, and it's it's very do it yourself because he hasn't even got an electric drill, so it's a handheld drill, and and he's describing having to like drill this into the bone. I'm sorry if this, maybe I should have done a warning with this, but it's and and then he he actually says. He actually says, and then we paused, and he puts this in very kind of like formal scientific language. And we weren't quite sure if we'd, we'd broken through because we did feel better, but then we thought that maybe it was just because we stopped drilling a hole in our heads. So I was reading this and I thought, okay, I'm just gonna throw this idea at my students, trepanned. None of them wrote a poem on this, neither did I until six months later, for some reason it surfaced in another form entirely as these things often do. So thank you very much uh, for, 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 for listening to that. <laughs> and, to, and thank you very much, Cassandra, for, your, um, uh, and, and for being a wonderful host. I can see your smiling face there and Mark and everyone else here. Um, and um, so I'll finish with this poem, Trapan, this sonnet. Uh, it's really a bad relationship poem, isn't everything? Bad enough not to have trekked the Himalayas or smoked a pipe in the back of a Volkswagen bus with Storm, the mechanic, who, with blessings from us, changed the oil and filter en route to enlightenment. Let's just say 
you were part of my dimmer days. I turned the lights down low to cosmic bliss, laughed at the spirit in spirits, excited the man, a corporeal slant. And all I wanted was this, one little plastic piece of that five and dime belief a novelty axe to hack at the totems of numbers on your PC screen. I wanted hand relief, that is, the gentle touch just before you go under. Nothing profound, nothing deep, which is why I let you drill that black and decker into my third eye. How did that work out, Eva? <laughs> More later. Ah, very mysterious. Very mysterious. Uh, thank you so much, Eva, for that wonderful reading. Uh, thank next, you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, next, we hear from Vic Shirley, who is, I believe, in the UK at the moment, maybe in Bis Bristol. Um, I'm not sure if right now she's there, but she she goes, she gets around. Um, Shirley is a poet, writer, editor from Bristol, now living in Edinburgh, a collection of the, the continued closure of the Blue Door from HVTN, her pamphlets, Corpses, Sublunary Editions, Grotesquerie from, for the Apocalypse from Bear Boa and Poets, the Red Sea Links Press, and her book of photo poetry, Disrupted Blue, and other poems on Polaroid from Hester Glock were all published 2020 to 2022. Her um, sonic sequel in To Corpses Notes from the Underworlds from Sublunary Editions featuring illustrations by Joshua Rhodes will be published in the autumn, uh, as will Stranger's Wave, Joy Division, Photo Poems, Zim Zala. Uh, Vic's work has appeared in many places such as Poetry London, The Rialto, Magma, 3AM Magazine, Tentacular, Perverse, Shearsman, and Tears in the Fence. Uh, Vic has a PhD in dark humor and the surreal in poetry from the University of Birmingham and is an associate editor of Sublunary Editions and co-editor of Surreal Absurd for Mercurius Magazine. Welcome, Vic. Hello. Uh, lovely to be back at Lip Balm again. I think it was a year, was it a year ago, the Dada extravaganza? Yeah, it was yeah, that was really that was really good good fun. Um, so yeah, it's nice to be back um, again. And thank you and happy birthday to to Mark as well. I hope you're doing something fun tonight afterwards, something crazy. Um, so um, I'm think I'm going to read some newer work, um, as in stuff that hasn't been in sort of books or pamphlets before. Um, so stuff that's going to either be in my sort of new collection, which will be out in um, 2025, or uh, I have got a new pamphlet, which is sort of finished and out there, which hopefully will be being published somewhere soon. Um, so I'm going to read some new stuff, but I'm going to start off because um, with a couple, and I'm so annoyed I didn't pick up the physical copy of it, um, Mad Hat Press, Cassandra um, and... Um, uh, Johnson, Peter Johnson, Peter Johnson. My mind has completely gone blank. Yeah, the yeah, the great Peter Johnson um, uh, published some prose poems in Dreaming Awake, uh, which is a contemporary uh, prose poetry uh, from uh, from UK, um, Australia, um, and America. Um, so I'm going to read just a couple out from from there because it was lovely to be uh, really, really lovely to be included in that. And I'm going to read my poem spells. I'm so annoyed I'm not reading this from the book now, but I haven't put all my books in alphabetical order yet. And I just, if I, if I popped to get it, I would, I could be gone for quite a while. So, okay. Should have put the timer on. I'll put it on now. Spells. We came out from the bunker and there was nothing left. It was just dust and milkmaids, was it? Oh, and tapestries, plus form from the Unemployment Bureau and a few pens, but only green pens. It wasn't much to start with, but we soldiered on. Eventually, we learned how to conjure food items and summoned ourselves some packet soup and fig rolls. I perfected a spell for sawdust so that if anyone learned how to conjure guinea pigs, we'd have something for their hutches as long as someone learned how to conjure hutches. 
Start from scratch was tough, but it gave me the opportunity to put my past and associated record behind me. And no one ever found out where my real skill set lay. And I'll read number two. It's quite nice to be reading. I mean, I generally surreal prose poems are what I, you know, are really what I what I do most of all. I think last time I did a lot more experimental work uh, because it was the Dada extravaganza. But it's nice to be reading some sort of surreal prose poems here. Lost in a mansion. Miranda began to cry. It had been years since she'd been lost in a mansion. It must have been at the 2010 Get Lost in a Mansion competition, which she had very nearly won. She had won the 2009 one, which was an incredible experience and why she had started to cry at the 2010 event due to overwhelming memories. Unfortunately, this surge of emotion cost her the championship. Someone with far less capacity than her for getting lost in a mansion won, which was a huge blow. So... After much consideration and wishing to retain some degree of dignity, she retired. Yet here she was getting lost in a mansion again. This time no one was here. There were no cameras, no get, it, get lost in a mansion cheerleaders or crew. It was just her getting lost in a mansion, crying. In the ballroom, the ghost of her family Shih Tzu appeared, licked her face and whispered some words of encouragement, as it did when she was a child, just starting out in this whole getting lost in a mansion game. Some kind of training montage ensued and she was finally able to get more lost than she had ever got before. OK. So I'm going to read a poem that was uh, recently published in Tiny Molecules, a American magazine and it's called more than a feeling okay that is the wrong poem it's not my poem i'm looking at <laughs> it's a completely different poem bear with me okay where's that gone then i'm just going to read it from i'll just read it from this uh, other document instead it doesn't happen when you read from books, always read from books. Here we go, more than a feeling. The only thing that made her happy was listening to Boston's more than a feeling. It started ironically as many of these things do, parties, air guitar, rock and roll hand horns. Next thing you know, this woman's got a convertible, the top down, driving down highways, looking earnest and wistful and saying, Jesus, I love this song, under her breath, clenching her fists tightly, lost in the sheer power of the track. She's walking into bars, buying whiskeys for guys, taking them back to her motel, making love to them, swishing her long blonde hair about with Boston's more than a feeling playing. By now, she can only climax while listening to the song. She then starts collecting guys, training them to learn to sing it. She keeps them in the basement, feeding them only traditional foods of Boston, such as Boston baked beans, Boston chowder, Boston cream pie. Eventually, one of them escapes and blows the lid on her. Others weren't so lucky. She is sentenced to the electric chair, but is allowed to listen to her favourite song as they throw the switch. Okay. I'm going to read, what am I going to read? Um, I'm going to read, I had a, um, there's a really good uh, magazine, if no, not, people aren't aware of it. There's a lovely online UK magazine, um, but they publish from all over the world. Great following, great editor called Anthropocene. It's edited by Charlie Bayliss. And um, it's really worth checking out and submitting. They have windows um, that you can submit in, or uh, you know, if you if you you've got something really good and want to get published, they I think for a fee they'll they'll do it. They look at it in sort of twenty four hours or something like that. Anyway, um, Charlie has published three of my sort of newer poems. I said for my next um, collection, so I'm going to read two of those, and I think I'll finish on something a bit different. But um, this one's called the Wet Hollows. The forest is attempting to gain custody of me on the grounds I have a leafy nose. No one has the energy to contest it, so there's a good chance it could all go through. I like belonging to the lake and I'm surprised and disappointed the lake is willing to entertain this prospect, let alone allow it to happen. The lake took me on due to my watery holes and my watery holes have never failed. 
I've done exactly what is expected of me, therefore fulfilling any unsaid obligation. So I should like to understand why it is letting me go. And I should like to take a look at the legal records and all the related documentation. And I should like to know what to expect once the forest has custody of me and what will become of my watery holes. Thank you. I think that one, that one was very heavily influenced by Zach Schomburg, who is, um, I mean, yeah, I've got some of my biggest influences. I mean, James Tate, Russell Edson, um, Daniel Carms, um, you know, huge influences. Um, but um, I think one of the new, most exciting sort of newer surrealist, surreal, absurd sort of poets, I think, is, is Zachary Schomburg. And um, yeah, okay. I think. Did you know that? Did you know that Alex Segal, who is reading with us tonight at the end, is the translator and editor of Daniel Calm's um, the, really? last, yeah, the last book that came out with Northwestern U Press, right? Um, great oh, book. goodness. Great book. So he's reading with us at the end. You guys should connect. Yes, I will, uh, I will, I will listen to that. And I need to get a copy of that book. That one's... Um, I'm really familiar because I did do a lot of Daniel Calm's in my PhD. Um, and I work quite closely with Today I Wrote Nothing, which uh, Matt, Matt Vajagankelevich translated. And that introduction was very, very useful. But I don't know. So I'm going to make sure I get this. And that's I'm thank you for bringing my attention to that because I wanted to hear it and I want to buy it as well immediately. So thank you. Um, in fact, what I might do, because I don't have my I might just finish on one long, quite longish poem, which is a Sistina because we're sort of running out of time. Um, and because we had a sonnet, we've had a, a sonnet from Eva, it might be nice to have a, have a Sistina um, to finish on. So let's do, let's do that. Um, uh, here it is. Okay, so sip of wine. I can, I can drink wine because it's 11 o'clock here. So it's all early, early for you guys uh, where, where you are, but uh, you know, I can justify it by it being 11 o'clock on, on a Saturday night. Okay, Sistina for Rock's Ghost. Mabel didn't have the energy to land the plane, so she kept flying, or cruising rather, while passengers looked at each other with bemusement and slight annoyance at her playing such terrible music over the tannoy, as almost none of them liked the genre of soft rock, and literally none of them wanted to be John Bon Jovi. However, unbeknownst to those on board, until this fateful day, John Bon Jovi did want to be one of them. Perhaps the person you'd least expect on the plane. I mean, if you were looking at them all with a Columbo eye, Rock Hudson would be the last choice. Not just because he's dead, but as there were other passengers who wore a permed mane like 80s John Bon, liked the sound of their own voice over the tannoy, donned tight leather trousers and had a tasseled jacket flicking about to everyone's annoyance. But it was Rock Hudson John Bon Jovi wanted to be. The annoyance and confusion when truth came out was widespread. What surprising taste John Bon Jovi harboured, and how had Rock Hudson come back from the dead, someone asked over the tannoy. Then it became apparent that it was, of course, the ghost of Rock Hudson on the plane, and not Rock, Rock Hudson himself. John Bon had met the ghost, along with another of the passengers, at a little soiree in New Jersey, where celebrities and ghosts of celebrities go to rock. John Bon had never met anyone like him. Boy, that ghost knew how to rock. John Bon prided himself on his drinking, but Rock's ghost was better to his annoyance. And wow, his dancing had all the girls and girl ghosts dancing to Iggy Pops, the passenger. The soft rock god had never seen such a thing. Hey girls, he said, my name is John Bon Jovi. The girls didn't care. By then, Rock's ghost was telling an anecdote about flying a plane. They were laughing, gazing at him when call for Mr Hudson's ghost came over the tannoy. But back to the here and now, how did anyone find out about this years later over the, over the plain tannoy? For nearly a decade, John Bon had been disguising himself and um, following, uh, had been disguising himself and following, um, oh God, I've lost where I am now. I'm following the ghost of rock, but remember someone else there that night witnessed the anecdote about the plane. Someone else who followed John Bon as he followed rock to take that call. Annoyance wasn't the word for it. Red, then blue with more than a splash of green. John Bon Jovi turned as he listened to the conversation. Rock called the girl on the phone passengers. This was the name of John Bond's girlfriend uh, that your girlfriend liked to be called. No one else was called passengers. It was too unusual. 
The ghost of Rock Hudson had won his girlfriend's affections. From the tannoy over the plain, shot through the heart and you're to blame, the song by John Bon Jovi made the ghost of Rock Hudson startle. You give love a bad name. This soft rock classic was no coincidence, he thought, and turned. On seeing John Bon, the annoyance was subsumed by fear. John had a gun and shot Rock's ghost, forgetting he was a ghost on a plane. The aircraft went down and the passengers were killed as they hit the rocks. John Bon sang Living on a Prayer the whole time on the tannoy to everyone's annoyance. The ghost of John Bon Jovi emerged to see Rock, Rock's ghost flying away in his private play. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Vic, for joining us on this fantastic occasion. Um, <clears throat> next, we hear from... Robert Archambault, whose two, book, whose two Manhattan Press books include The Kafka Sutra and Inventions of a Barbarous Age, Poetry from Conceptualism to Rhyme. He is also the author of the scholarly studies, Laureates and Heretics and Poetry and Uselessness, and the essay collections, The Poet Resigns and The Literary Bohemian, among other titles. His next books are the novel Alice B. Toklas is Missing out this November, from Regal House Press and available for pre-order on Amazon and a translation of the works of the Belgian surrealists Gabriel and Marcel Picaret with uh, Jean-Luc Garneau um, coming from Mad Hat Press shortly. Uh, Bob chairs the English department at Lake Forest College, God help him. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Mark. I wanna, I wanna make sure everyone notices that uh, I knew I was coming after Vic and I knew she liked surrealism. So I had my office painted to look like a Magritte painting. This is a uh, 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 <clears throat> last minute work, but I, I wanted to share that. Um, I like surrealism just like Vic does. Uh, and Mark had asked me to read from uh, the translation of Jean-Luc Garneau and I did of Gabriel and Marcel Picaret, who are my favorite surrealists because they're Belgian surrealists and Belgian surrealists are the best surrealists. They're like the French, but uh, less pretentious, you know, um, uh, less ambitious in, in terms of uh, writing manifestos. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm gonna betray Mark's birthday request that I read from the Picaret brothers. And instead, uh, I'm gonna read about three and a half pages of the novel, Alice B. Toklas is Missing, in which Gabriel and Marcel Picaret in fictionalized versions appear uh, as the surrealists uh, Gabriel and Marcel. Um, that's the novel um, coming out in November. Uh, long story short, um, a young Midwestern uh, a woman named Ida uh, gets caught up in the Gertrude Stein circle in Paris when Alice B. Toklas, uh, Gertrude's companion, uh, is kidnapped. Uh, Ida has followed her um, wannabe writer husband, Teddy, who is a talentless schmuck and he never writes. And Ida has the talent, but she doesn't know yet. Uh, she's followed him to Paris. They've gone to um, Shakespeare and Company, um, the original one, the Sylvia Beach one. Uh, and Teddy's decided he's got to modernize his mind uh, quickly. So he's bought all the different literary journals and he sends Ida out to fetch the ones that he can't find uh, there. And Sylvia has given Ida the address of the Bureau of Surrealist Research, which is a real place. Uh, what is the nature of the Bureau of Surrealist Research? You're about to find out. So a few pages of the novel. A quarter of an hour's brisk walk westward took Ida to the narrow Rue de Grenelle cool in the shade of the tall buildings that stood on either side. Ida stopped and consulted the card Sylvia had given her, number 15, and here it was, a storefront like any other, though with heavy curtains covering the lower half of the windows, obscuring the interior from sight. A frosted glass door read Central Surrealiste in large letters, with a smaller Bureau de Recherche Surrealiste beneath. She hesitated. Everything about Shakespeare and company had felt familiar and welcoming. American voices, American books, the feel and furniture of an American front parlor and expats like herself. She was an expat, not a tourist, wasn't she? 
greeted one another with smiles while checking their mail. Whatever lay beyond the frosted glass door promised to be otherwise. Did you simply walk in as into a shop? Did you need an appointment, a password, a secret handshake? All she knew of surrealism was that Andre Breton seemed to be the ringleader and the whole group cultivated the bizarre. But she was on a quest, she told herself, and entering new worlds was simply what people on quests did. She tried to think of a painting of an Arthurian knight braving all danger, but the only thing that came to mind was a John William Waterhouse picture she'd seen in a book, A Lady of Shalott, alone in a rowboat drawing in her breath. Ida was sure the artist wanted her to look alluring, but those open lips, as Ida remembered them, just made her look distressed. Ida drew in a breath of her own and pushed through the door. She didn't know what she'd expected inside. Dragons, maybe, but not this. The Bureau of Surrealist Research resembled nothing so much as the outer office of a minor Chicago ward politician, or perhaps one of those settlement houses where immigrants were given brochures for English lessons and a map to the public baths. The room was sparse, with a single long table stacked with pamphlets and books, a couple of framed photographs on the wall, and two doors toward the back. At a large desk in the center of the room, two men in shirt sleeves sat opposite one another, shuffling papers. No one spoke to Ida, so she stood and watched. The first man, round faced with a bulbous nose and a bristly salt and pepper beard, the same length as his bristly white hair, was blotting paper with ink, then methodically folding the sheets in two to make symmetrical smudges. The second man, squat and solid like his peer, was writing a word or phrase on a small index card, then using those funny triangular French paper clips to attach the cards to the blotted sheets. Although the second man was bald and beardless, the two looked much alike. Could they be brothers, Ida wondered. The two took no interest in Ida, so she spoke in her best French. I am looking for a journal of surrealist literature. Both heads swiveled toward her at once, like synchronized automatons. Then the bearded one looked at his companion. Marcel, he said, she wants surrealist literature. There is no surrealist literature, said Marcel flatly, his eyes boring into Ida as if he wanted to see through her or inside like an x-ray. Surrealism is not literature. Surrealism, he gestured to the table of ink blots and index cards, as if it were sufficient explanation, is research. Ida chose to be unfazed. I am searching for Mr. Breton's magazine. Breton? Marcel looked incredulous. Did, did he say it was literature? The last word seemed to be held with tongs as if it were somehow infectious. He snapped his head to look at his companion. Did you put him up to this, Gabriel? You wouldn't. Gabriel began to spread his arms in a Gallic shrug, but I didn't, by the way, there's got to be a better word than shrug. You can't translate the French because an English shrug is this, and a French shrug is this, which is entirely different. I don't know how to handle the situation. Anyway, Gabriel began to spread his arms in a Gallic shrug, but Ida intervened. Mr. Breton said nothing of the kind. The error is mine. Désolé, monsieur, but do you have a copy? We may have one for you, said Marcel, in the tone of an impatient bureaucrat of the pedigreed variety bred exclusively in France. But all visitors must participate in research. Gabriel stood and with a slight bow and a kindly tone asked, won't you take part? Ida peered at the table. One ink blots index card read, the mother. Another, simply, fear. What is it, Ida asked, that you research? The unconscious, said Gabriel, at the same time as his companion blurted out, liberation. They looked at each other. Liberation, said Gabriel, carefully looking to the other for confirmation of the unconscious, for the freeing of desire. His companion bristled slightly at the assertion. 
Marcel kept his gaze on Gabriel, suspicion in his eyes, but he nodded, adding, for the freeing of desire, and therefore for the revolution, the total renovation of the dead bourgeois society in all its forms, laws, institutions, even its poor and failing arts. Gabriel gestured to Marcel with an open palm as if accepting a tenuous truce. Martel, Marcel attached an index card reading machine gun to a sheet of paper with a large roundish blot of ink, then rose from his chair. Chance brought you here, he declared, as if reciting lines from a sermon he had given many times. Sacred chance, chance, unlikely juxtaposition, coincidence, dreams, these are the tools of our research, unlocking what we keep from our conscious minds. It was, thought Ida, Sylvia's directions and her own curiosity now piqued that had brought her here, that and Teddy's fear of appearing behind the times. But Marcel continued, and now we must ask, what impulse moves you? He rose and took a step toward Ida. What coincidence haunts you? Huh? Um, and what did you dream last night, Mademoiselle? What did you dream? The last words were enunciated with a great precision and emphasis, a prosecutor skewering a witness mercilessly. While Marcel spoke, Gabriel took a large ledger from inside the desk. Coincidence with what, Ida wondered, and what dreams? She looked around the room as if it would jog her memory, then saw the stacks of dusty pamphlets, the plain furniture, and then the photographs on the walls. The first depicted a group of well-dressed people in an ordinary parlor, staring intently at a bare mantelpiece as if it held the most fascinating oddity. The other photo showed a woman, one from the other photo Ida noticed, sitting in a chair in an attitude of exaggerated horror, her arms thrown up, her eyes protruding, her mouth opening as if to scream at the sight of the object on the table before her, an ordinary hen's egg. Marcel cleared his throat, impatient at Ida's long pause. The egg, blurted Ida, the, the egg. Both men looked at her in excitement, Gabriel pausing over the ledger he had opened on the desk. Last night, she continued, I dreamed of an egg. It was true. And the two men reacted in great urgency, leaping away from the desk, pulling a chair back for her, thrusting a pen into her hand and placing the great yellowed ledger before her open to a ruled page. Right, said Marcel, hot breath in her ear. Don't think, added Gabriel. It's better not to let the pen pause even for a moment. Ida wrote. She wrote quickly, brow furrowed, biting her tongue a little as she did when taking exams in school. Faster, cried Gabriel as she wrote. More automatic, urged Marcel urgently. And then you get to read the dream, but uh, not now. For that, you need this. Available for pre-order on Amazon and soon in um, audiobook format. Uh, Mark, happy birthday. Thank you for having me. Thank you for publishing the Pika Ray Brothers. I love those guys and uh, you too. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Next, we hear from Amelia Walker, who lectures in creative writing at the University of South Australia on the unceded lands of the Kaurna people her fifth poetry collection, Apologesis, uh, sorry, Alogopoesis, sorry, Alogopoesis is coming from Life Before Man Gazebo Books in November, 2023. Uh, Amelia has also published educational resource books in Macmillan's All You Need to Teach series and creative writing research in journals, including text, axon, new writing, the journal of autoethnography, the journal of gender-based violence, and the edited books, Poetry and Sustainability. Amelia is interested in creative writing's connections with knowledge, social justice, and change. Welcome, Amelia. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I was so excited when I found out about this reading only recently. I wish I'd known about it for longer, and I'm certainly going to be a regular listener. Um, I, I really love anything that connects poets in different parts of the world. Um, so I thought today I'd read from two anthologies that do that. Uh, the first is, oh, I can't get it on the screen, but Renew, Relocate, Restore, um, which is edited by Rob Maddox-Howell and Jadeet Sarangi. And Rob and Jadeet have 
over many years put out a series of these anthologies that compile work by poets in India and poets in Australia. Um, I published a sequence in this that is, um, I guess it's COVID themed poetry, apologies if you're sick of that. Um, it's dedicated to my friend Achinta Gupta, who was a Kolkata based journalist, activist, publisher, and an amazing human um, who was also a victim of the Delta wave. The Plains and the Birds. When the planes were grounded, the birds came back, their songs filling the spaces between sirens. It seems such a long time ago now. Oh, it's been only two years and the sirens haven't stopped, but there's more space between them and less. Now the planes are back. Yes, they're back. Although people are still sick and dying at rates that once made headline news. It seems such a long time ago. Now there's other things to report, like fires and floods and bees near extinction. If the plane stopped again, would that change? I'm selfish. I switch off and wallow in thoughts of friends I plan to see again someday, a future still coming not long ago. It's spring now, but the sky is green. The sky is grey. I listen to sirens. I listen to silence, remembering how when the planes were grounded, the birds came back. It seems such a long time ago. When I got sick, I thought of you. I thought the thing that killed you is inside me now. And weirdly, that helped get me through. Those long days flattened in bed, trying time after time to rise, then stumbling, dizzy, realizing just how sick I was, imagining you going through it in your village, cut off from things that might have eased the pain or maybe even gotten you through. In that same village years ago, we laughed, sharing whiskey and adder in a circle of poets. When I got sick, I cried for you again, like I cried after your sons told me you were gone over messenger of all things, a must message I struggled to let get through. Across such distance, sudden and dull, no final toast, no handshake, no goodbye. When I got sick, I felt close to you, touched by what took you, madness, but it got me through. Um, something slightly, hopefully, lighter than that. Um, I'm going to read from the Alcatraz anthology, um, co-edited by the wonderful Cassandra Atherton. Um, this will be my last piece because it's kind of longish. It's called The Black Shoes. As a child, I was told the story of a girl whose red shoes enslaved her, made her keep forever dancing. Later, I would own a similar pair, except mine were black, purchased for work, worn with thick stockings and a pencil skirt in which I could take but the tiniest of steps, always in straight, straight lines. Yet that too is a kind of dancing, a moving to the beat. In this case, one that beat me as I struggled to keep pace. Hence why I bought those shoes, as opposed to any other regulation, black with close toe and small heel but not too high, you've got to walk bitch pair on sale that day. I wanted them for the sound they made, click clack like castanets, announcing each footfall, reminding me and all around just how fast I was moving to how regular a beat. Not a waltz, nor a tango, oh no, more so rigid, frenetic legs repeating patterns drilled a little deeper through each instant in which I followed and was led. They made me able to keep up those shoes, made the thought of falling out of line impossible, unthinkable. They made so much unthinkable and thus made me able to do other things, things I might otherwise have questioned. They're clicking like a second hand, like the ticking of a bomb reminded me there was no time for questions. Bitch, you're paid to dance. So dance, dance to the song being played. Don't suggest other rhythms. Don't try to flip our disc. And so 
in those shoes, I dance, 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 barely feeling the blisters, nor the aches in legs forever racing like a panicked clockwork heart. At night, though, I kicked them off. I would find myself still dancing, taking orders in my sleep. Even now, years since wearing their soles to holes, years beyond the day I finally said I'd walk away, I catch myself sometimes saying no to some possibility I've not paused to consider. I catch myself falling in with certain rhythms, certain rituals, and I ask myself, if I ask myself why, I can't say why. That's just how it is, how it seems it's always been. Then I look at my feet and I see them still dancing, still so blistered. I hear the click clack like wagging tongues, like laughter. And I know those damn shoes, they're still there. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Amelia. Um, so now we're gonna do a, a little special feature um, on, on one of my poems, All the Steel, uh, which comes from my book, uh, Coalition Number no. Nine. And my cohort and illustrator of my book is going to present the images um, as they appear. So yeah, this book, every single poem, um, prose or, or lineated, um, is illustrated by Jake, Jake Watt. And um, so we're going to bring out this um, amazingly printed book uh, we're not sure yet exactly where we're going to print it. We're talking to people in Venice about printing it on a really just like beautiful high end level um, with, um, you know, stencils and, and all that sort of thing. Anyway, um, Jake is a very talented artist, uh, stage designer and um, filmmaker. And uh, here is coalition number nine all the steel and hopefully i can get everything to function well as as needed be um hold on. give me a second oh yes here we go All the steel, one. All the steel was needed for propping up the world, all smelted in our furnaces and hand cast, teased into the edges and bevels we all so well know. It was said that in our, our foundry a lone bat lived. In the eaves, a giant fruit bat who dove for mangoes and apple stalks after the second shift in the third quarter after the decommissioning of workshop number 45. Stainless steel was no longer called for in the decomposing age. It must rust and flounder and flake under the weight of years. It had to brown and gray it had to get under the fingernails like the bugs we found in our bed. They were funny. Those little segmented raisins scattering from wall to corridor. And they'd let you take them in your hand. And they ran patterns of eight and zero. Zero was a favorite. I always bet on the zero. Infinity was more your piece of toast. Two handcrafted handcrafted is the approach we wish to take said the manager in workshop number 42 his glasses were askew and looked like they would slip up his nose his hair was full of grease and his khaki tie was a shaved slate at best his mouth pursed as he spoke and one of his eyes quivered but he was known to string together the best folk. He wore a chain around his neck, a talisman, to a, a reminder of what might have been. 
every link had a second thorn. Three, he eyed the crowd gathered round his podium and pointed at me. Tell me, citizen, how do you feed the fire? I beamed, stood square and shouted out, as the blessed Lord may please with shards of his soul. May the soul feed the fire. May the fire feed the soul, shouted the manager. You have to know, he said, we were brought here onto this planet for a purpose, for the pain of it, not for your iridescent smile. The workers applauded, tapped their chests, swept back their hair. They knew everything lay in their own hands. And for that, they were grateful. Thank you for having the patience with that. But next we hear from Gary Finke, uh, whose new essay collection, The May Mayan Syndrome, will be published in late September by Mad Hat Press. Its lead essay, After the Three Moon Era, was originally published at Kenyan Review and was selected to be reprinted in Best American Essays. An earlier collection, The Darkness Call, won the Robert C. Jones Prize from Plebiades Press 2018. Welcome, Gary. You there, Gary? We lost you? Have we lost Gary? Oh, no, the, Gary's there. I can see him. You need to un unmute. I've asked him to unmute, but we'll see. Okay. All right. Uh, he's Gary, got to unmute. <laughs> yeah. Can you see oh, I'll yay. But now, can you turn your video there I back am. on? Yeah, now I got rid of myself. Uh, <laughs> All right. That, that's my icebreaker, I guess. <laughs> um, but I was I was just going to say it's one syllable despite all the letters. Um, but what, what I'm going to do, uh, uh, the book that Mark mentioned, uh, is the bulk of those essays are long essays that are highly associative and uh, attempt to carry and hold on to, you know, uh, maybe as much as many as the half a dozen threads. Uh, but the short essays in, in the book are very straightforward and they probably make better reading for a Zoom reading. And, and what I'm going to do is just simply read the three shortest essays uh, from this book. And I'll kind of read them in the order of most stripped down to, to the third one, which kind of hints at what I'm talking about uh, for the longer essays. Creekside. The babysitter lived in a large house with a yard bordering a creek that emptied into a river less than a mile away. That proximity worried my wife and me, but our son was the only child the babysitter, a woman recently separated from her husband, said that she watched for extra income. The house was large and clean, everything in its place in a way that su suggested responsibility. The arrangement worked well for nearly two weeks, no matter my wife's erratic, erratic work schedule. The babysitter was waiting with our smiling son in her living room when I arrived after school. Our son even seemed happy when I dropped him off, no longer crying like he had at the former babysitter's apartment where he had been bitten twice by an older child. Friday afternoon of the second week, I parked as always where the driveway ended at a patch of worn grass near the back door. I knocked, then I knocked again. While I waited, I noticed how full and deep the late spring creek was running less than 50 feet from where I was standing. At last, I turned the knob and the door unlocked swung open. Our son stood there smiling. I picked him up, hugged him, and called hello twice before I began to search the house, finding a babysitter asleep in an upstairs bedroom, sprawled in a way that made me think she could have been drinking. The babysitter gathered herself and mumbled. I must have dozed off for a minute. She didn't seem to recognize what the problem was. He's two years old, she said. He can't open the door. 
more than two and a half, I said, already walking toward the stairs. He's opened doors before. The babysitter followed me down to the kitchen where I put our son down at last. Maybe at your house, but not here, the babysitter said. He knows not to touch, so there's no problem. I started to list disasters, encouraged by a sleeping babysitter, all of them preceded by opening a door, falling down the cellar stairs, pulling cleaning products from under the sink, and loudest, drowning in a rain-swollen creek. That's extreme, the babysitter said. He would never go near that creek. While I counted out what I owed the babysitter, our son turned the knob and opened the door for us to leave. Trust me, the babysitter said, that's new. Before I had finished explaining how I wasn't bringing him back on Monday or any other day forever, our son run, ran straight to the car. See that, the babysitter crowed, as if that proved something. See? The second essay is uh, actually it's about my one of my granddaughters who just happened to spend the last week uh, with us is now in in college, uh, but she lives in Los Angeles. Uh, <clears throat> this is from several years ago. On location, New Year's Eve. Because my granddaughter is fifteen. My company, <clears throat> my company is necessary for each mile-long walk to care for two dogs and a cat. Because our street, the last hundred yards of our walk, feels dangerous for anyone. Because the street is really an alley and badly lit. Because there are budget apartments that sit below the narrow street on one side, rather than more single dwelling houses and duplexes, like the ones set into the hillside on the right. The new year is four hours away when we leave the apartment my wife and I have rented for six weeks to avoid winter and visit with our recently remarried daughter. She has saved her honeymoon week until we were available to watch over her daughters. The only complication has been those animals need attention three times a day. Halfway through those last hundred yards, an empty car is double parked in the alley, the driver's side open. Lights extinguished, a curiosity so close to her house. My granddaughter veers right and I drift her way as subtly as I can muster. The next bend takes us into the street's deepest shadows just before the flight of stairs to the door. Those apartments are sketchy, she says, when we are inside. The dogs welcome us. They go out the back door and soon return expecting food. The cat, as always, refuses to be seen. In the bedroom, my granddaughter shares with her 12-year-old sister, we play records I've sent her for Christmas, used albums of mine from the 70s. I've guessed that she'd love Queen, Judy Collins, Linda Ronstadt, Harry Nielsen, thinning my collection and building hers. We spend an hour with the music, including an entire side of Nielsen Schmielsen that my granddaughter sings softly along to. The dogs, instead of settling, are restless, pacing to windows and back to us. Neither of them barks. As soon as we walk around the bend, beginning the return trip, we see two police cars by the double parked car, its door still open, but now a young woman is inside. Except for the policeman who waves to invite us past, Whoever arrived in those two marked cars must be inside. What you looking at, bitch, the woman says. The policeman's wave shifts into demand. That's it. Keep walking, bitch, the woman calls as we pass them. Fuck you, bitch, she yells as we clear the scene. I wish I hadn't looked my granddaughter says when we reach the busy highway at the end of her street. Did you look? Yes. But she only talked to me, she says. 
I think of comforting or explaining, but settle for, you'll never see her again. We have nearly a mile for the return walk, but all the rest is where traffic, even on the holiday, is constant. Because we both know there are fewer shadows on the other side, we wait at the first intersection, an awkward one, three streets intersecting the main highway, a series of left turn lights extending the wait. Down the sidewalk on our side, we can see a small crowd is gathered where the apartments have a lower entrance. The dogs knew, didn't they, my granddaughter says, after we have crossed. Yes, they must have sensed when the police arrived. Back in the apartment, we stay up for the bells and sirens and fireworks from a thousand yards spreading toward the city. My granddaughter and I, both terrified of heights, choose to stay inside when my wife and her sister step out on the 12th floor balcony. They look like they are in terrible danger, like they could vanish when the railing they lean on collapses. What do you think she could have done, my granddaughter says. Before I can answer, she adds, she didn't look much older than I am, whispering, as if it were a secret. And finally, uh, I should give a shout out to Brevity, which is my, one of my favorite uh, magazines ever. Uh, and one reason why I really uh, became immersed in, in writing essays specifically, uh, that are 750 words or fewer. Uh, and this one happened to appear in brevity a couple of years ago now. Uh, it's called The Old Phrases, and it has an epigraph. Billie Holiday's 1944 recording of I'll Be Seeing You was the final transmission sent by NASA to the Opportunity rover on Mars when its mission ended on February 13th, 2019, which served as a trigger, really, uh, for this particular memoir piece. And it's in three parts. First, at the center, my father's friend, Harry, a man whose memory has perished before him, says, are you from the neighborhood? Are you here to take me home? My father adjusts his pillow. You're petered out, he says. Get yourself some shut eye, relying upon his old phrases for comfort. As if he has dropped suddenly into sleep, Harry slumps in his wheelchair, but my father, instead of reaching for Harry, lays a hand on my arm. He keeps it there, his lips silently forming the major count of a boxing referee. At 17, Harry stirs and sits upright. Can I trust you, Harry says? Can I trust you? And when my father nods, he quiets. We shuffle, we wait. At last, Harry gnaws one word from the thick bone of his past. Abyssinia, he says. Abyssinia, as if an exotic sounding ancient name would unlock our encrypted identities. Soon, my father pauses in the doorway to wave. Abyssinia, he calls to silence while I wait in the hall on the road. Any more, my father says, as I drive us to the cemetery, none of my friends knows beans. When I miss a turn, he sighs. When I turn into a wide driveway to correct myself, he stiffens and holds his breath until we're realigned. I slow for the gated entrance, turning between the pillars embossed with crosses. My father opens his window in and it inhales. The early spring clods over us as I slow to barely moving and ask about his friend's secret word. Abyssinia, my father says, it was a country once. As I search for the pair of junipers I used each year as a landmark, my father says, Abyssinia, say it fast. I'll be seeing you. Harry and I were just kids back then. There was a version of it by Sinatra. He drifts into his own rendition. 
softly in his threadbare bass. He carries the tune through wistfulness as if it were a gravely injured body. In the cemetery. This will be the day my father fails to find my mother's grave. The old phrases follow us while we search. The promised cold front wind carries the flurries of a Western Pennsylvania in late March. Flakes that go to water when they touch the landscaped earth, creating a damp point pointillism of where we walk. I know we are close. There is time enough not to help. Back and forth, my father paces while I watch the nearby woods at the cemetery's border. I can tell he is using his footprints in the wet grass as a guide. Three 20 yard loops, just over a minute, take him to the plot. When, at last, we lay our flowers beside her name, my father stumbles into silence. The day by now is full of the hum and whistle of devotion just out of reach. I imagine a tune for the present while we wait for the necessary words to embrace us. The old phrases clasp their hands and lower their heads. They recall my mother's mouth repeating them throughout each day, how she relied on them for the selective memory of her final years. Shuffling in place, they begin. This language or none, for you will have no other. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Gary. No other for you. Next, we hear from the wonderful uh, poet, writer, edu educator, editor, and translator. Leah Graham, who lives in Hyde Park, New York. She is the author of two poetry collections from the Hotel Vernon Salon Poetry Press 2019 and How and Helix and Where and Here and You, You, You from Notel Books in 2011. Uh, also an edited collection from the Word to the Place, essays on the work of Michael Anania from Mad Hat in 2022 and three chapbook, chapbooks a spell to spell above ground press the end of the world uh, and calendar girls above ground press also um leah is an associate professor of english at marist college welcome leah thank you can you hear me yes yeah, great okay i'm gonna start um with a poem for you mark the title is for you but the poem comes from or it's it started with bob archambault's essay on andy warhol and so which got me started thinking about other art that i hate so don't hate me for hating what i hate but anyway i'm not a big fan of andy warhol but archambault kind of convinced me a little bit and then i started to think about the other kind of art that i get very tired of and since i've lived in florence italy a number of times um this really you know was actually part of my every day and i really can't stand madonna and child in in child so i thought this is a good challenge to see if i can convince myself uh to to see to appreciate at least anyway so i tried to uh use the andy warhol repetitions to to get at the madonna and child anyway so mark here's your title your birthday title genius how's that okay that's nice, that's nice. okay genius it's a fact that Andy Warhol went to mass every Sunday. Don't believe me. Look it up. Refer to his 60 last suppers near the end of his life. One might think there is meaning to be found if you look deeply into the color and shadow of Jesus, Marilyn's lips, Campbell's soups near Cafe Aroma. But blankness was the quality he most loved plastic, white on white. He yearned for vacuity in others himself. 
the more you look at the same exact thing, the more the meaning goes away, the better and emptier you feel. Two. The second part has 10 little parts. And the epigraph comes from Jeanette Winterson. Repetition has a religious element too. One. In the Madonna of the book, baby Jesus extends his sticky little mitt towards the page about to smudge it up for fun. In the other, he holds three golden nails in a crown of thorns, a birthright. Our Lady's gaze into the book of hours, resignation for what's to come, a young mother's glazed look of up all night. Two. In Madonna of the Goldfinch, Jesus, the toddler, reaches for the bird like a benevolent old man. Will he gentle this symbol of redemption or snap its neck at the last second, a momentary pleasure to squeeze and because he can? Three, in Botticelli's Madonna of the Pomegranate, the blue eyes forlorn as they look forward, but the fruit ponies up flooded arrows nesting incisors, a heart's trunk packed with 613 mitzvahs, fertility or contraception, garnet and grenade. Four, in Madonna of the Chair, his chubby knees and the fabric's folds create them human. Their expression or retraction moments safety, caution. That young punk John the Bee leans in just back from walking the tracks, slugging home grew from a skin. Five, is the irreverent cherubs bored with Jesus, Jesus, Jesus at the bottom of the Sistine Madonna who camp it up? Mary has just blown in from warmer climes. The baby, a handsome pragmatist, will in time hike mountains, sum up a desert, Harley with that old cat, Lucifer. Six, in Caravaggio's Madonna with St. Anne, we see the looping serpent in her red dress, the breasts pushed up fashionably, her foot extended to kill the snake. And circumcised Jesus follows suit as if to learn to dance. Anne, a quiet grandmother wrapped in darkness, observes this foolishness. The women wear their halos above their heads like inverted hoop skirts. Seven, Parmenino's Madonna with a long neck suggests a swan. Has she put on his knowledge with his power? The child gangly and splayed almost floating across her modernist lap. The pieta played out decades early. In Madonna of the Pinks, it's their cheeks, his penis and scrotum, lighter than the flowers themselves that bathe us in comfort. Dianthus, flower of God, said to have sprung from her tears at his death, the ruins out the window, that same old landscape, Rome, Aleppo, Mariupol. Nine, Jesus clutches the cross like a stake in the Alba Madonna. He's fierce, I, I and the young John in a wolf pelt, while his mother relaxes in the grass. Years later, they will be secreted away to Asheville by train, hidden behind steel doors, barred windows, in an unfinished music room, waiting out the war. 10. Despite the nickname of Madonna Cassini, it's the flatness of her analysis of the child his near grin that presents a picture of the way we know this will all end. Her two fingers in blessing and tickle, the baby swaddle. They say Masaccio was so talented that he was poisoned at 26 by a jealous painter. The second poem I'm gonna read, thanks. Um, the second poem I'm going to read also, is, again, Mark, thinking of you and your translations here, um, is a poem, also another uh, another word, uh, alma from the Spanish, meaning soul, essence, life. And, and the, you know, folks who, who translate know 
the word soul is just the devil to have to translate. So this that this poem comes out of uh, of working, trying to work through that anyway. Alma. It has a little bit of soil in it, she says, touching the tip of her finger to her tongue. The word seems flames up, tastes like a place we've been, a place we've known. In translation, it's smoke, not the event of fire, gap and gob, nothing and everything, damning stain to the famous blue dress, a nameable yearning to self, in poems of young poets. Name of my grandmother's hometown, name some say for the postmaster's sweetheart, others say drawn from a hat, or that of my favorite therapist, dear Alma, spelling me in that weltering landscape. And I'm gonna finish with a poem. I'm, I, you, the first poem was so long, I feel like, you know, I can, I can, get away with just reading one more. And I'm gonna uh, read one of Mark's uh, from his, Here Comes the Night Dust, uh, because you know I think he and I share a love of, of travel and living all over the place as much as we can anyway, or at least in our past. So this one is Triptych for Iceland. Threaded through the Highlands eye, Arteries to the civilized, the mule pack of traders, sailors, trawled halfway across the globe. Dots speckled on the map to here. Waste stations slopping in whale fat, salted in mackerel, herring, potted shrimp. And those who rode winter storms, aquavit warmed, who froze in their skins and never returned, whose ghosts are the waves and the whistling wind, earth compounded in molten glass, ossified in legends of invisible people before talk, before song, before white parasols, and anglers flying plastic insects beneath the meniscus of the mountain. They set shallow roots cling on wind feathering like the faithful in their pews. Thank you all very much. Thank you much, so much, Leah. And thank you for that last poem, really. And next we hear from Alex Segal. Uh, Alex, who has been out of view, I think, for the last three or four years, um, but is an, a Russian-American English language poet, translator, editor, and erstwhile professor. Uh, Alex's poems have appeared widely in many per periodicals, such as the Colorado Review, Green Mountains Review, North American Review, Tampa Review, and the Literary Review. Uh, Alex's translations from the Russian can be found in Cimarron, Literary Imagination, Modern Poetry, New England Review, Pen America, and many other places. From 2011 until 2013, uh, Alex was assistant professor at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, he was born in Chernos, Cher, sorry, Chernovsky, Ukraine, and lived in St. Petersburg, Russia, near Tel Aviv, Israel, and near Rome, Italy, before immigrating with his family to the United States in 19, uh, 1975. Uh, Alex has been awarded an NEA in literary translation for his work of the poet uh, of the philo philological school, Mikhail Eremin, and his first book, Russian Absurd, um, Daniel Kahn's Selected Writings, came out from Northwestern University Press in 2017. Welcome back, Alex. Thank you, Mark. Um, my goal is uh, modest today. It's to entertain. Um, and um, I, um, I, again, happy birthday, Mark. Thank you so much for bringing me out my semi-retirement. Um, I'm trying to pick up uh, literally and figuratively and literally pick up where the thread where I left off. So I thought I would read from a, an issue of a magazine, Traffica Europe, pen, um, UPenn, that I edited before I sort of stopped working um, about four or five years ago and um, decided to read some prose. So... 
this is a not too long satirical piece by Igor Sachnovsky. If you're alive, the boy had no father. Sorry, the boy had no father whatsoever. And his mother was there so rarely, he sometimes doubted her existence. You would begin to doubt it, too, if your mother kept calling you an animal for no reason, rushing off at 7 a.m. on some sort of business and crawling back home after 11 p.m., flinging herself on the couch, wearing a bra, bra only moan, I'm tired as hell, leave me alone. You did, however, have an Aunt Ada, mother's sister, though you wouldn't guess it by just looking at them, who was being courted by some nine very impressive gentlemen, each genuinely wanting to be, become the boy's uncle. One of them was even the director of a factory that manufactured refrigerator, refrigeration equipment. One can, of course, understand what these suitors saw in her, for Aunt, Aunt Aida was, to put it mildly, a ravishing beauty. First of all, she wore, wore spike heels, and that in itself is a sure sign of hotness, in contrast to the mother, who never took off her grandma booties. Ha, ha, I just accidentally made a rhyme. Beauty, booties. At this rate, I'll turn into a poet. And second of all, her eyes were the color of plums, and in their slant they resembled plum pits. And her gaze was like that of an odalisque, simultaneously fiery and submissive. Words don't do them justice. Better you go yourself and ogle an odalisque. And thirdly, such an agile, careful gait as though she was wading into a river, or her legs felt too confined above her knees. The boy had already grown even with the aunt's hips, that is, he lived at her feet, and for this reason he always grew still and tremulous upon hearing the rustle of her tightly stretched nylons. Once every week, the aunt would come by to visit, to discuss with the mother the prospects of the nine suitors. She would sit down on the sofa like a queen, slide her heels out of her shoes, and massage and pet her sore toes as though these were some sort of fledglings. The boy worried himself over the chances of all nine. Wouldn't you, too, not want to get stuck with just anyone for an uncle? Taking advantage of the opportunity, the boy would slide into the aunt's shoes and execute the circus act of walking on stilts, a genuinely elevating experience. The mother would say, he's an animal, he'll break your heels. The chances of the individual men fluctuated dangerously. The refrigeration factory man often jumped in the lead. Then, out of nowhere, appeared a small bald man by the name of Marek with a large mouth and dog-like eyes. He was so unprepossessing that he didn't even make it into the legitimate nine. He was just circling at, on Aras Ada's heels all by himself. He even told her directly, if you want to, you can go out with these, but you'll wind up living with me. Well, of course, why not? Everybody just dreams of living with him. That was my mother's reaction. But Aunt Ada was hysterical and in a rush because she has another year, maybe a year and a half, and then it's all over. Call her an old spinster. And then it happens. The refrigeration director permanently divorces his wife and their child because the wife screams obscenities at him, calls him impotent, doesn't cook for him. He comes home hungry after work. The wife calls him names, and he, instead of appetizer soup in the main course, munches on chips and sucks down some candies. Or he's obliged to eat dinner out at the fanciest restaurants in town. Aunt Ada pities him deeply, almost to tears, and wants to feed the director him herself. Though, if truth be told, candies with chips and sodas are a hundred times tastier than soup and salad and restaurants are far more interesting. Right before the wedding, the aunt asked everyone to call out, not to call out the toast bitter, bitter, because she's not comfortable kissing in front of people. You'd think that she didn't have any intention to ever kiss her husband, but only to ply him with food. For their honeymoon, the director of refrigeration units suggested 
Turkey, but Aunt Ada had a hankering for the town of Anapa on the Black Sea. She had vacation and sunbathed there as a girl in high school, and so they went off to Anapa. They rented a place outside of town from a pretty and portly little woman, half of the house with a veranda, drank wine, ate salad made from the famous local tomatoes, and went to sleep because the first night of their married life had now arrived. In the morning, Aunt Ada went out on the veranda in a dark mood, and the first person she saw was little, little bald Marek. It turns out he had also spent the night with them on the veranda, or perhaps even outside the door, but he had already found time to put away his bedding and shave. Good morning, Marek announced, launching into his morning calisthenics routine. The newlywed Aunt Ada went off to the beach for a swim, mightily surprised. And the refrigeration unit immediately stormed off to inquire from the lady, what the, uh, the landlady, what, what the fruitcake performing squats and standing on his head was doing there. The landlady informed him, the man is a tenant, very respectable, also arrived yesterday, and she began fixing her hair. The next morning, Aneta came out of the room puffy-eyed, and she again walked smack into the wily, all-knowing Marek. And the next morning, and the next. On the fourth day, the weather turned nasty, gloomy, and teary-eyed, like Aunt Ada's mood. Drowning in the puddle by the porch were the lost chickens and the remnants of hope. Only Marek alone was bright and cheery-eyed. If Aunt Ada got herself together to take a walk, he was already standing at the ready with rubber boots and an umbrella. The refrigerator man insistently offered to change places of re residence. It was better if he kept his mouth shut and not offer up any other bright ideas. How all this came to a head is one of those mysteries of nature. But in the end, Aunt Ada returned from the Black Sea together with Marek, calm and glowingly beautiful, even more beautiful than usual. And after another year, there wasn't anyone alive who was closer to the boy than Uncle Marek. You could ask him anything you wanted. Not once did he ever not have an answer. Even about the, the most insignificant thing. Let's say, why is it that everyone loves beer? He will definitely know the answer in the most ex exhaustive detail. Once every now and then, he would go off to do his manly stuff, to drink beer. That is, the uncle would set off, and he'd secretly, secretly take the boy with him. He'd even let him drink a whole half from his glass. It was somehow bitter in the mouth. Even port wine tastes better. So why then, I ask you, do people love it? I will explain, said Uncle Marek. Beer, beer should not taste good. The best thing about beer is the burping afterward. Once you've drunk it, you, you wait around for the onset of the burp. Sometimes they talked about women. If the, in the uncle's opinion, they are angelic beings, but dangerous. And why dangerous? I will explain, said Uncle Marek. Among women, feelings take precedence over thoughts. But they distinguish these feelings very poorly. For example, you have spent your entire lifetime satisfying her every whim. Yes? And she suddenly boom and loses all interest. And then an earth-shaking mystery of the universe was revealed to him. It turns out that women sometimes experience a female madness, sort of a sexual fit. And then it's all over, lock, stock, and barrel. The husband and the wife are glued together at the hip till death do they part. Only a surgeon can separate them. Can you imagine the indignity? Dragging yourself to the hospital in such an attached state? What's there to do? The listener would by now be in a state of despair, but the uncle knew but the uncle knew a way out. A man of experience always carries on his person a needle. If you suddenly prick them, the spasm will pass all by itself without assistance from a surgeon. And what if you're swimming in an ocean or a river? Then what? And suddenly you get a leg cramp. Once again, a needle would save you. After such practical, useful conversation, one could socialize with women or swim in the ocean with much greater confidence. 
In the same beer hall at that time, some drunken soldier would not leave the uncle alone and kept pestering him with the nationalities question. He called Uncle Marek a kike to his face and then shouted an, in an idiotic voice like some sort of people's deputy on television, what have you Jews done to our Russia? The boy was sure the uncle would now um, have an answer. I will explain. Well, and so on and so forth. But he kept his mouth shut. He kept he even kept silent after the soldier dumped his glass of beer on his pants. When they were going home, the boy kept trying to find out why Uncle Marek didn't smash that idiot on his noggin. Why? Was he scared? Of course I was scared, Uncle said. I was I was afraid I would kill him and be locked up for 15 years. Then what will become of, of Aunt Ada? That is when it became patently clear that when little bald Uncle Marek is angered, he becomes a terror, like the Terminator. One time, he was meeting Aunt Ida by the clinic where she worked as a lady doctor, and some guy, either a maniac or a robber, wouldn't leave her alone. He caught up with and grabbed them by the collar of his coat. In the aftermath, one could even feel sorry for the maniac, because Uncle Marek helped this maniac by the hair on his head and banged his head right against the wall of the clinic until he knocked off a serious piece of plaster from it. While the boy was growing up, uh, I will finish. I, I'm not going to get anywhere at the end. Uh, I will uh, at the end of this page. While the boy was growing up, he couldn't keep up with all the. Um, you know what? I'm going to stop because it is getting late. I apologize and plan it better. Uh, you can find the rest of it on Traffic of Europe. Thank you, Mark. Well, that's all, Alex. You know, that was wonderful. And also, I think we should should say that Andrew Singer, who founded Traffic of Europe, recently passed away. Oh, my God. I didn't know. Yep. Yep. Um, and it was very sudden. But he had been going through some illnesses and so on. I know that for a fact. So, yeah, Andrew, Andrew's gone. Sorry to say that. You, you look pretty stunned. I am. Yeah. I had no idea. <clears throat> Thank Sorry you, to end this meeting, Alex. Thank you. Go and check it out. Anyway, yeah, poor, poor chap has, you know, moved on to the uh, next sphere. Thank you so much, Alex, and and thank you, of course, Eva. Vic Shirley, Bob Archambault, uh, Amelia Walker, Gary Finke, and Leah Graham as well. Um, and now I'm going to hand the show over to my co-host Cassandra for a little live uh, okay. uh, happening. And by the way, at the end, I still have something to say, but you know, it's, it's my birthday, so. <laughs> so you're allowed. Everyone can do whatever they want on their birthday. It is a birthday open mic, and we have to start with John Wessick. The wombat has to rule first, I think. John, what have you got? The wombat something? has to rule. That's it. <laughs> the sound of Sikorsky VH3DC King's rotors landing on a western Massachusetts estate where there are more woodland voles, southern bog lemmings, and star-nosed moles than people, interrupts a 16-hour love-making session. A man <laughs> with a chiseled torso gets out of bed, leaving a naked Hong Kong airline stewardess behind. A five-star general meets him at the door and hands him a satellite phone with a secure line to the White House. What is it this time, Mr. President? Terrorists have taken over a missile silo. He sighs. All right. I'll be there in 20 minutes. He is Mark Vincennes, coolest man in the world. On his way to the helicopter, an Asian woman in a skirt slit to her hips skis to the bottom of Greylock Mountain, inspiration for Herman Melville's Moby Dick, and approaches. I have the location of North Korea's nuclear weapons. She runs a fingernail down Mark Vincent's shirt front. Perhaps we could go over the details in your bedroom. 
I can fit you in on November 23rd, Mark Vincennes makes a note on his smartphone. Will 1.30 be okay? Mark Vincennes is coming! Mark Vincennes is coming! Suicide bombers drop their vests and zip-tie themselves to fire escapes as Mark Vincennes pilots the helicopter overhead. M4s at the ready, soldiers in winter gear huddle against the North Dakota wind behind their Humvees at the Minot missile base. What's the situation, Colonel? Mark Vincennes asks. Got a dozen of them holed up in an underground silo. They don't have the launch codes, but if they set off the rocket fuel, they'll spread radioactive contamination over 2,000 square miles. I'm going to need these supplies, Mark Vincennes hands over a list. The colonel scratches his head. I don't think we can get fresh prawns this time of year. Will Frozen do? Damn it, man. This is a matter of national security. Make it happen. With a napkin folded over his forearm, Mark Vincennes carries a silver tray to the silo's entrance. I bought you dinner. We don't want food, a terrorist says through a door crack. We want a trillion dollars worth of platinum bullion. You sure? Mark Vincennes fans the delicious aroma with his napkin. I've got rickshaw noodles, clay pot rice, steamed dumplings, and egg tarts. Smells pretty good, the terrorist opens the door. Flinging a clay pot like a throwing star, Mark Vincennes disables the terrorist. He then tosses a durian into the silo. Seconds later, the terrorist runs screaming into the courtyard, where they meet a hail of bullets. Vladimir Putin's only escape from a bad year is a weekend at his private dacha with Nadia, the Olympic gymnast whose body can do amazing things in bed. Excuse me, sir, an aide enters the room. Telephone. I gave you orders not to be disturbed, Putin says. But it's Mark Vincennes, something about getting our troops out of Ukraine. With thoughts of Nadia forgotten, Putin picks up the phone. Mark, buddy, haven't seen you since you kicked my ass at that judo tournament in St. Petersburg. I, I'm, I'm like a rarely speechless, but you outdid yourself this week, John. That was sensational. I will never forget that. I love the sass. I, I, I am completely speechless. I don't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> Coolest man in the world. I think that's all we have to say now, isn't it? Mark Vincent's coolest man in the world. I loved the Durian moment. That was such a good moment, John. You are amazing. Thank you for being so generous and kicking off open mic like that. Thank you and happy birthday, Mark. <laughs> DeWitt, we've been waiting for you. We miss you. DeWitt in his chair is up next. Am I live? You are live. Okay. Your blue t-shirt. You're good in blue. <laughs> awesome. Um, this is a thank God short poem. Um, it's more probably about poetry than it is about birthdays. It's called Pratt Fall and uh, appeared in the Somerville Times <laughs> this week. Now it's wrapped in fish. Your middle brother promised to catch you. He had practiced himself with your oldest brother. Remember? Stand straight, face him, hands at sides, shoulders back, tuck chin, lean forward like a board. Don't catch yourself or step, no hands out. Just topple. They try, but take a saving step. Don't worry, we'll try it again. I'll catch you, promise. You do, this time. He does, inches from the ground. We made an act of it, not only on backyard grass, 
a rug inside, but on our swimming club cement, while others stared. That's love, he said. That's faith. That's life, I think now, both for clowns and children of alcoholics. Happy birthday. Wow, what an ending. I love the ending. It, you don't see it coming at all. But it was in the Somerville Times, seriously? <laughs> That's incredible. Thanks to the holder. <laughs> no way oh my goodness that's awesome um it's a great piece i have trust issues i don't let anyone catch me because <laughs> i've been to too many of those work things where they make you kind of you know throw yourself backwards and you land on the floor so i loved that poem it was beautiful sort of the Thank opposite you. of pulling a chair out from underneath somebody <laughs> yeah yeah linda we have a poet laureate i always forget what it's of linda i should write it somewhere i'll beat poet laureate of massachusetts I'm writing that down. All well, right. Mark and I, you know, Mark and I live in the same town and we get all these awards. So I don't know what to tell everybody. Better move here. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Take uh, it anyway, away. so um, I'm going to read this. It doesn't have anything to do with birthdays, but the last stanza mentions fireflies and that's important. <laughs> so the name of it is Another Day with an epigraph from Veronica Roth. It's strange how time can make a place shrink, make, makes its strangeness ordinary. Sunrise unzips another dawn, days infinitesimal. I count time in hours, minutes, like a clock that ages this ragged world. If all clocks stopped, what I know of time and its essence, I imagine time standing still like the lives of mannequins in storefront window casements of uninhabited businesses. Sometimes clothed, often naked, their posture is unhuman-like, bent in erratic, eerie positions, while their vacant eyes gaze endlessly, focusing on nothing, complexion flawless, figure slight. A purse dangles from a wrist, ready for an outing, a date, a chance to escape this window's prism. Another wears a wristwatch, not set to correct time, a convenient denial. Time is just a construct to manipulate history and human activity. Sundials, an ancient time teller, clocking the day's passing seems an appropriate alternative. Sundown zips up another day, as dusk fades to black. I watch night stars flicker, a comet soar, an orange moon appear from behind a mountain's crest, a falling star. I ignore time and its passing, revel in the black sky, the illumination of fireflies, their ability to create light within their tiny bodies, never bowing to sunshine, married to the night. Thank you. Wow, Marriage of the Night. I love a firefly, but I mostly only see them when I'm in America or Mark sends me enviable uh, photos from um, his backyard, <laughs> which is a very big backyard. Yeah, there's a lot of them because we're in a rural area. Happy Thank birthday, you. Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Time standing still like mannequins. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Linda. You're welcome. Next, we have Kurt. Kurt is here with us and he is going to give us something delectable, no doubt. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay, we can now. Right. Awesome. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to read uh, a, a, a few parts of a poem called uh, A Few Choice Poulenc Notes. Poulenc was a pianist in the 30s, 40s. Interesting gentleman. Um, it's done in four sections like Snaz, but I'm just going to read the section, three little parts here. They're short. Adagio. Do we see us as we truly misbehave? Slipshod, naughty, addicted to our own duplicitous excesses, no cheap glossolalia breezing over the particulars, like a syzygy, an exegesis of the quotidian, floating mid-sentence in a zoftic ineloquence as I keyboard these words. I watch the bony articulations in the tops of my hands shuffling 
in and out of their thin drawers of skin. Scherzo, too often taken for granted, we ferry our feelings about, between, away from, or towards the more brittle points in our lives, looking for certitude. Death is the gravamen of life, but you are redolent. The wet tongue of my eyes licks the perfect bouncing curves of you that enthrall me past our bedtime. Questions should never be so short as to be answerable, nor should they be so long as the moon is far away tonight, whispering of changes in the weather as we trundle headlong forth into the wet pluvious days of spring. There's sweet alchemy afoot in the lunar-soaked seashells fluttering bivalves and mussels, spitting water, opening and closing in the rushed shallows as high tide tips the whole earth over, jangling the pro-preoceptive motions of my body this early morning as I look up at the sky, perfectly even-bellied and lavender. Allegro. Once we were the upstairs lovers with tongues, tasting, touching, degage lips with that deliquesce over the oeuvre of each other is how lovers speak to unsubtle eternal darkness. Plump, pregnant, jolly belly, you've become a zephyr circulating on tiny, puffy toes about the clothes-strewn house. And I, fay pray, that these ho-hum, humdrum days will work their way slowly, but slowly, out of my calendar. I'll tarry here for a while. As you lean forward, I taste the earthen, red-tinged mahogany of your soul. Wow, what gorgeous malafrasis. Wonderful. I like the exegesis of the quotidian because I love that the quotidian always means that there's something extraordinary following it. So thank you so much. Next, we have the famous duo of Cindy and Bob. Cindy with her new computer. I'm very excited about that for you, Cindy. What have you got for us, Brooklyn Badass? Well... Last time we were here, you told me I have to come with an alliterative poem next time, so I wrote one. But it's not quite as ambitious as John's, so I'm just prefacing that <laughs> so you'll know. It's short and sweet. An alliterative poem with the letter M. My merry melody is meant for Mark. Magical, mystical, maven, and multi-talented, multi-genre, mad hat manager. From Matilda's maternity to the utmost mountain of Melville in Massachusetts, where he makes all his money and where there are more mice than men, many marvelous returns. Mr. Mark, moi, moi, moi. <laughs> I love it, Seeing That's so Marilyn Monroe of you. I love it. Mark's going to have the biggest head after this show. That's the only thing. Moi, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. It was awesome. Oh, <laughs> Bob is up next. I said to Bob, <laughs> we can't. We can't have a, a lip balm without Bob from his kitchen. So he's he's come in. He has an extraordinary piece, no doubt, to sign off the day or begin it like I'm beginning it. So, Bob, what wonder have you got us today? Okay, I've got one. Uh, and happy birthday, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I don't have a poem for you, though. <laughs> but I, I want more information. You know? well, you're going to get some information. Has to be like the story was, meandering a bit with no destination in mind. He didn't know there'd be bears. He didn't know there'd be a boat or a hat filled with bees. He expected choices, but not the choices he was given. 
Everything changed when the woman spoke. Everything changed when the car wouldn't start. That's why I love you, Bob. You just give me so much to think about. And yeah. no one writes poems like you. There is the Heman poem oh, that uh, the, car, the car could never start. Yeah, that's 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 almost <laughs> obvious, right, Bob? You got bear, he also got bears and beans in there. I think you've got a bear <laughs> motif in some of your air. <laughs> I love it, Bob. And I love your dishcloth and your T-shirt and your kitchen. Thank so you. uh, it's wonderful to see you. And I think we're back to Mark to close off his own birthday show if his head fits in his Zoom box. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So here are two, two last poems before we close out. Um, but before I do that, I think I should tell you uh, that on September 9, we have John Hennessy, Rue Friedman, and Nathan McLean, and it should be rocking and rolling. So please do join us for that. <clears throat> but to conclude my birthday show, so here are two little poems. One's called before farms were run by artificial intelligence. The other one is called A Crow Delivers Salient Points, but we'll start with before farms were run by artificial intelligence. Nobody is looking ahead, but sees yet stirring in a political tide. <clears throat> and the wave of possibility still persists. Perhaps there is a, an element of laziness, a warm subterfuge to benignly smile under the eye of the landowner. How much love is needed to build a combine harvester to wake the sleeping farmer from their downy pillows with wheat and durham and flax and emma and corn and soya and rice with potato and plantain and cocoa and coffee, with tea and tomatoes, tomatoes, and transitional milk, with pasteurized and hydrogenated citizenry, sodium nitrate, and her half-brother monosodium glutamate, glutamate will find their pathways into all their arteries, and the sugars will coalesce on their shores. And the question posed was where is all the energy spent and assigned? And then how is it apportioned out? Is it a matter of faith that these creatures will, as a matter of course or DNA, if you will, will themselves into the concept of efficacy? in ultimate, perhaps celestial design, that life is self-fulfilling, ever acceptable, continuously evolving toward the future. And therefore, the faith suggests that the creative principle, tendency, inclination, that trial and error learning by doing slow accumulation has led us to this very point in history, the moment the emperor reads us our rights, if not I, no one would take charge, he roars. And one more. And this, this is probably most salient because it's a crow that delivers these, these points, a bird. A crow delivers salient points. It becomes easier to search for worms when you're at ease with the breeze. Bones with traces of marrow are to be found everywhere. Follow the sound of the largest beak. They will know how to peck and sing. Tear flesh as close to the sinew as your reach may allow. Follow the wolves, follow the lions. Use your shadow to create panic, then perch and wait. Don't show off your plumage unless you are absolutely sure yours is best. Allow the magpie and the jackdaw their little misgivings. 
give off no known odor by rubbing yourself in a cocktail of slime and mud. Learn to observe everything from far above. Comment only when called upon. Comment sporadically or nod your head. Thank you, everyone, so much for this wonderful evening. Thank and, you, Sue. Uh, Have I hope a tiny haiku. Can I read it? Oh, yeah, go, 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 go. It's a, uh, I just wrote it for birthday. Birthday wishes burn like candles on buttercream, crescent moon waxes. Birthday wishes burn like candles on buttercream, crescent moon waxes. Happy birthday. Just Thank wrote you. it. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you so much. That's so lovely. Thank you, everyone, for a wonderful show. And don't forget to join us September 9 for the next one. And uh, we shall be rocking and rolling for sure. And lots of love and poetry to everybody. Love you. Take care and see you soon. Bye, guys. Bye.